welcome to the Built on Air podcast, the variety show for all things Airtable. Each episode, we cover four different segments. It's always fresh and different and lots of fun while you get the insider info on all things Airtable. Our hosts and guests are some of the most senior experts in the Airtable community. Join us live each week on our YouTube channel every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And join our active community at builtonair.com slash join. Before we begin, a word from our sponsor, OntoAir.com. Any business running on Airtable gets the value that Airtable has, but also needs a few more functions to complete their operations. That's where OntoAir comes in. It's a suite of tools for any business running on Airtable to maximize your operations efficiencies and automations. One customer, John, states that OntoAir enables his business to function properly without having to think about building their own software. And that is pretty invaluable. The OntoAir Airtable apps are amazing and we use them often and are very happy with the results. So join John and hundreds more customers and take your Airtable to the next level with OntoAir. Sign up today with promo code BUILTONAIR for a 10% discount. Check them out at OntoAir.com. And now let's check out today's episode and see what we built on air. Welcome back to the Built on Air podcast, season 13, episode 7. Good to be back with you. We've got a full house here. Myself, Camille, and Alice. welcome. Hello. And we've We've got a new face here. I'm actually going to uh, take our banner off so that we can see everyone. There we go. Jeremy, welcome. We've got Hi. Jeremy Ogilvy with us, and we, we will be uh, his back, background and story in the world later in the segment, but I will walk through what we're going to be talking about today. As always, the Built on Air community or the podcast is an hour long show where we talk about all things Airtable and what is going on. And we have four different segments. Our first is our round the bases to get you up to date on everything new happening in Airtable. Then a quick spotlight on on Onto Air, our primary sponsor. And then we'll, we'll learn about Jeremy and his background and story. And then Jeremy's going to share a cool base that he has built in the adventure gaming world. And then a quick spotlight on how to join our community. And then finally, Ali will be showing some scripting and how to keep linked records sorted. <clears throat> okay, let's see what's going on. Around the bases. So first, let's start off big event coming from the world of Bill and Chris and Ben We're at the Airtable community. They announced, um, first, actually, this is not, is this it? No, no, no. It's kind of it. <laughs> um, so they have the, the announced, um, and it would be at the headquarters for uh, a table. I'm losing connection. Again. <clears throat> oh, no. Well, I'll restate right. it. Just So Dare Table is happening. Yeah, go for it. I was just going to say, um, so the Airtable conference this year is uh, going to be at the Airtable headquarters in San Francisco. Um, and this is the third year that Chris Dancy has uh, put this event on. And I believe the second year that Ben Green has assisted. I could be wrong. Um, but last year was super fun. We all went to Austin, Texas and Um, We were joined by some uh, employees of Airtable, and this year we're going to be in the headquarters. So, you know, the API call will be coming from inside the house. (laughs) Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Very exciting. 
so there is a limit though that's the one thing only 75 tickets because it's in a limited space at Airtable headquarters so get your tickets today <clears throat> So go to daretable.com for more information. Excellent. All right. Any other comments on Daretable? I will do my best to attend. I thought I was going originally. I'm pretty sure I'm going, but I'll have been starting a new job. And so that's always iffy whether or not you can get the, you know, the hours off. So the hope is that I can go. Yay. Allie, are you making it? Yep, I bought my ticket this morning. Nice. Jeremy, is that in the plans? No, unfortunately not for me this year. Oh. Not making it this well, year. That's a long right. trip out there from Arkansas. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> cool. Well, hopefully we'll meet some of you all there. Um, we'll do something. And uh, excited to, to see everybody. I will be there. Um. Okay, next, a few announcements from Airtable. They were busy. A couple of things got uh, released. Um, they did release the repeating groups of actions in automations. Mm -hmm. So in automations, the ability to loop through records and perform tasks on a per record basis is now live. Uh, thoughts on that feature? Have you played with it? Yes. Um, it is, it's one or the other, whether or not an, um, an automation can do conditional actions or, uh, repeated actions. You can't have both a conditional group or series of groups and a repeating group. Um, so if you have an existing automation, you should be able to add repeating actions to it. Un you know, unless there's already conditions in it. I think that's what I've experienced. Mm -hmm. Um, it. Uh, so far works as expected to me. There is, I do wish you could, as it's looping through, it will give you whatever the current item in your loop is, uh, but it doesn't give the item index. So if you have 50 records found from a find record step, it doesn't let you know that you're on 30 out of 50. That could be useful in a lot of different ways. And so I, you know, am hoping that in improvements down the line, they include the loop index and sorting of arrays. That'd be great. Yeah, exactly. I'm also, um, it'd be great. It looks to me right now, I haven't played around with it a ton, but I think it only works with linked record fields and lookup fields. Um, it would be nice if we could use like fields that are inherently an array that Airtable sees them as, but it would be great to be able to use a string and then tell it what the delimiter is. Um, or even if you just give it a number field, if I say, you know, if I give something five out of five stars and a rating field, maybe mm -hmm. I want to loop for each rating. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, that's definitely, you know, moving in the right direction. You can see them slowly eating into the Zapier make, make um, use cases. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is a, a big one and being able to loop through those. And the good part, I think Camille, you mentioned, it does not count as like additional execution limits. So they only count at the top level execution. <laughs> so every time an automation is triggered is how they count your automation runs. Yep, yep. So nice release. Right. <laughs> to Zapier when it's like the loops in Zapier do eat away at every single mm -hmm. task step that you pay for. Yep. Is there a limit on the number of uh, records you can query in their find? Yes. Query? So, so the find records step has a limit of 100 records, 100. which is pretty small, but you can use a, if you have a pro planner hire, you can use a uh, run a script action to sort of replace the functionality of a find record step. Mm -hmm. I do think the limit there is eight thousand i feel like i saw that number somewhere so there is another hard limit but it is far more than 100. yeah so if you were using automations to process like when a record triggered and you had like a simple automation that did something each time a record triggered 
one way to save on your automations is to like change that to be like a scheduled trigger and then do a lookup of any record that meets your criteria and then pass those through this. And now that only counts as one and you could do up to a hundred in that one. So save you some execution usage. <clears throat> Exciting stuff. Yep. Cool. It's glad to see that. All right. There was another big one. I'm sure everybody noticed this one. A refresh of their visual layout. Quite a bit of uh, changes. Um, the reaction was was mixed. I, I'd probably say it was definitely, I, I feel like the reaction was more on the negative side of people shocked from, from the reaction. I did see some positive. Um, I'll just go through. There was a couple reactions on Twitter of um, making it too faded. Um, some people said that if you're colorblind, this was a bad change. Um, there is some feedback in, in the built on air community. So, yeah, I, I pointed out that the two grays on the in in the other one, uh, the screenshot from the slack the two bottom grays on the right hand side to me look pretty close to identical yeah the other ones i can see a clear difference in, in between the colors in terms of saturation and you know how how dark each color is but i did find the grays a little funny yeah yeah initial reaction ali i i mean i noticed it it was funny i had two different tabs open um while they were pushing these updates out and one of them had the new look and one of them had the old look and i was like whoa what just happened um i don't mind the colors so much i what i really want is the ability to choose these colors for any piece of an interface and they seem to mm -hmm. you like the buttons you can only pick from from four different colors and your number elements and the, or not, yeah. I, I just want the same color choices across the board. It would be great to have more control and flexibility there. Dan, can you click and zoom into this image? Is it, is there any way to zoom into the bottom right of this? So what element is that? Because it's not quite the new list one. I think this is what I had seen before and I was like, I wonder when they're gonna release it and they released the list view and that distracted me, but it's still not quite this because it has filter, sort, search and a button, and a button at the top of it, which would certainly be nice, but mm -hmm. why is that in the branding package for here's the new it's colors me so much they the when they first came out with interfaces all of their marketing materials had screenshots of stuff that just wasn't possible to do with interfaces and right. i i told them i was like people want this like you just can't mm -hmm. you can't do it that way i don't understand i mean hopefully they're going in that direction but and there's yeah yeah or marketing I... coming soon or something but like what what is that <laughs> <laughs> Is it that might also just be a marketer or a designer's, you know, version of it. It could be because they could have just done this in it's, Figma and it has no real right. connection to the what they're actually doing in Airtable. But there's like yeah. this button up here. I don't I don't think that's a real icon. Is it? I can't tell what that is. Looks oh, to me like a full screen. Yeah, like what? What is that entire thing? It looks like an, an expanded record. Mm -hmm. it has the arrows on the sides. It does. Maybe, maybe this is going to be the new expanded record look. I know when they enabled in interfaces, you can expand a record and it goes to a new page. Before it would open the expanded record modal that we were familiar with, and now mm -hmm. it opens a new page. And they had talked about in a webinar that they will eventually allow you to do both. You can go to a new page or you can open a modal. And I wonder if this is the modal that would open. Could be. Maybe, maybe, maybe. So that's cool. What, what, what'd you think of the new icons? I think there's a 
I know there is a screenshot somewhere of the change in icons. They're all pretty thin now. I don't yeah. have more opinion than that other than they're they're thinner and I wonder if that makes them harder to see. Yeah. But they're yeah. they're pretty close to what they were. Mm -hmm. I think the icons aren't too yeah. different. They're not, they used to be boxed, more boxed. Mm -hmm. Now they're a little bit more floating. Like the timeline one looks a lot better, I think. Uh, or the Gantt, because it used to be encapsulated in a in a box. So in general, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm not super critical on those things. So uh, I'm okay with the changes. There's one thing that I saw that confused me and it related to colors the and this is very specific but if you know if you do a whole update of your design i noticed it if you go into automations and you have an automation that's turned on um, in the sidebar where it lists all your automations it's one green and then if you look at the top of the automation where the toggle for on or off it's a different green mm -hmm. why because <laughs> it wasn't like that before. It wasn't. So someone when it that's a conscious change or an accidental change, but they're communicating the same idea and it's the same segment of product. That's funny. Why? Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Camille's OCD is yeah. uh, driving her nuts there. This is why they bring me in for things, is just to look at, at screenshots of things very closely and to nitpick. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah, definitely changes. So they're they're moving forward. Um, see what they have in store next. All right, let's move on. This came from Twitter. So this is uh, I believe works at a venture capital firm, but must have a developer background. Um, and the cool thing is, is it, they, they, they wrote a script um, to where you could type in how you want to describe the base and they send it to chat GPT. Chat GPT knows the uh, API and the, and the, structure for Airtable and it provides, um, and it actually will create, it, it gets the code from ChatGPT on creating the, the tables and fields that you describe. And then it actually uh, executes that code. And so it's pretty cool. And the cool thing is, is, is um, this person shares the code so you can run it yourself. So, um, so you basically describe, you know, I want a wedding tape planning table with wedding guests, vendor, and budget. And, um, you know, it's, it doesn't support all the column types because Airtable doesn't support them. But here's the base. So you can click on it. <clears throat> and if you want to learn the code of how it works, it's all there. Um, so this is, this is pretty cool. We might do this as a segment in the future of actually running this, but you can see the code. You you do have to provide your own uh, open AI API key. And then it's kind of cool. It runs it and executes everything from, from the code that it gets. So that's a great use case of chat GPT. Awesome. Good stuff there. All right, our last um, one comes from the new table forums, um, Scott and Kavan, and, and we're also a sponsor of it um, from Built on Air. So definitely an active community. Check it out at tableforums.com or air.tableforums.com. Um, this is just kind of a, a, a show and tell from Scott talking about um, how if you have an enterprise, if you're an enterprise account, um, you can create what they call service accounts. That's kind of like a API key that's not tied to a user. So you might want to set it up for some kind of automation or third party integration, but you don't want it necessarily tied to a specific user because normally your API keys, if you're using OAuth or, or the new personal access tokens or the legacy ones were tied to a user. So any change 
was associated with that user. Now you can basically create like fake users um, and, and they have their own API key that can do things. So it's a good reminder, but it's only at the enterprise level. Yeah. We're checking out. Um, and then also wanted to highlight, um, Scott mentions this, I don't know where they're at now, but as of four days ago, so, so since uh, the launch of, um, table forums, um, you can get a badge that shows that you're a founding contributor. So if you ask a question or give an answer to a question, um, Scott will toggle that on for you. And then you can actually make your badge be uh, visible like a star like this. It'll say founding contributor, but if you want the star to show next to your name, then you can turn that on. And as of four days ago, there is only 10 spots left. I don't know if those have all been used up. Scott, if you're if you're watching, let us know how many how many spots are left. And um, so worth worth going and participating in the new table forum and get your founding contributor badge. All right. Anything else I missed? Any any updates? Any news going on in Airtable? I think that's it. Um, I don't know if we I missed last week. I don't know if you mentioned it, but they did. I saw they put a hard deadline, which I believe is March 12th on when they will actually start locking down bases that are over limits. So Yeah, I've been getting emails on that for a while. Yep. So if you've been relying on them never doing it, they're they're gonna do it soon and you won't be able to create new records. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. All right, just a second here. Okay, moving on. We're gonna talk about where did my mouse go? Um, on to air, our primary sponsor. So onto air is one toolkit to run your business on Airtable. It's a variety of apps that help you do more with your Airtable environment. So if your business depends on Airtable, you'll want to check out onto air. And for today's spotlight, I wanted to showcase you likely got a bunch of emails. Um, well, I got a bunch of emails because I have a ton of uh, Airtable accounts and all of them use the API. I got flooded telling me the changes to the API coming up. And um, so we got, we got a few questions from our clients saying, hey, I got this email from Airtable. What does that mean? How does it impact onto Air? So just want to give an update on that. We now have um, OAuth integration with our Airtable connector. So um, if you're using onto Air, you can now upgrade your connection to use the OAuth. You'll need to do that by next February. So you still have time. We'll still support the, the legacy API keys um, as long as Airtable does, which they've announced the, the beginning of February of next year will be the cutoff. So it's real simple. Um, go into your existing Airtable connector and then now you'll see there's now kind of two sections. We still have our legacy API key um, where you can where you can enter that in. But what you want to do is go to your existing connector and go through the process to connect it with um, Airtable using what is called OAuth, which is an industry standard. And that'll walk you through uh, uh, authorization process. So you no longer have to copy and paste any keys in. You just approve to give us permission to contact, connect with your base. And so the big thing is go to your existing connection and upgrade that one instead of creating a new one, because then that will save you from having to go to all of your backups or forms or anything and have to like re-authenticate um, any of those. As long as you're updating your existing connection, then that that's the only thing that you have to do. If you create a new one, then you have to go to all the places that were using the old one and update them to the new one. So much easier approach to just uh, upgrade your your existing connection. So excited to to have that in. Um, we'll be you know once we'll be pushing that more and more. And hopefully, if you're new to Ontario, just use the the OAuth so that you don't have to upgrade down the road. So with that, we're now going to 
learn more about Jeremy and Camille is going to walk us through his story. Well, Jeremy, welcome back to the Built Thank on you. Air podcast. Um, quite some time ago, we had you on uh, back when we were an interview type format. So for the people who haven't seen that episode, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you started to use Airtable. Sure, yeah. Um, so I was uh, I was working in the construction industry at the time, uh, working in uh, equipment and process QA. So my job was to make sure that our engineering firm uh, passed audits, um, which involved a lot of record keeping. Uh, and the company, uh, as is the case for many companies in the construction industry, was pretty behind the times when it comes to technology. Uh, doing pretty much everything with paper records. And the file cabinets were growing down the hallway, lining the hallway with file cabinets of records of uh, just equipment calibrations and, and uh, uh, training, you know, uh, 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 training records uh, for our technicians and just all kinds of stuff that we had to furnish and keep for five years uh, in order to pass audits. Um, so when I joined the department, uh, being the good, uh, millennial that I am, uh, told them, yeah, this, this is not going to work for me. <laughs> I'm not going to do paper records. This is crazy. Um, so I started, uh, and this, this actually, I, I'm a, I'm a software engineer now, uh, full-time software engineer, but, uh, this kind of started my whole journey, uh, into technology, I think. Uh, and into the, the software industry. Um, I started with uh, just tinkering in Excel, uh, as everyone does, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and learning some uh, visual basic for Excel, learning how to do scripting and, and whatnot in Excel to uh, turn those into like a, a form on one on one sheet in Excel and, and, you know, do the input in a form and then click a button that triggers a script, VB script, and transfers all that data into another sheet that acts as the database. Um, and uh, yeah, ultimately from there, started branching out and looking at other options because Excel just didn't have uh, great options for um, uh, for web connectivity and mobile, uh, mobile options uh, for when we were doing stuff out in the field, uh, you know, doing inspections, on-site inspections or truck inspections out in the field. Uh, so that's where I stumbled across, uh, Airtable. Um, and yeah, started, started building out a system for this company in Airtable for tracking, uh, equipment calibration records and inspection records and whatnot. Um, and, uh, ultimately from there decided that I wanted to do software stuff full time. Uh, so that, that began a whole, a whole process of uh, career change, midlife career change. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, I think something that many of us can empathize with. We have one problem that annoys us sufficiently that we stumble across Airtable and it slowly but surely takes over our lives. So in yeah. addition to using Airtable to make your uh, job easier and more, you know, less tedious, You've also implemented Airtable in your downtown uh, downtime for uh, helping to coordinate some of the more complex games you play with your family and friends. Let's hear a little bit about that too. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's actually, uh, I went through a period of, of doing some consulting and whatnot with, with Airtable uh, on my own. Uh, but actually over the last few years, uh, m most of my Airtable usage has been personal. Um, so that may kind of set me apart a, a bit from uh, most of the, the guests you've had on the show in the past where they're building out uh, business workflows and whatnot. Uh, most of my stuff is pretty whimsical and uh, it's just stuff that I feel like building in the moment and that I'm you know continually tinkering with over the years. Um, so yeah, I've built uh, the, the last time I was on the show with you, Camille, several years ago, uh, I had built a database for for uh, tracking scores for one of my favorite board games uh, mm -hmm. and I've since I've since uh, expanded that out to a couple other board games <laughs> um, so it's it, it kind of makes a fun little uh, hub for um, 
keeping a record of all our games and our scores in those games Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of divvying out where we got our points from in those games so we can kind of analyze our strategy across games. And I've got all my friends and family in the database and kind of views shared out uh, that they can look at and see their statistics and uh, I don't know, kind of plan for the next time we get together of how they're going to approach their, their gameplay based on how they've done in the past. It's a lot of fun. Do you anticipate joining some sort of turn tournament with your team who now have all of these statistics that would <laughs> put them in sort of, you know, prepare them for, I think most, yeah, you know, most game groups, <laughs> I have a game group and we are not organized yeah. at all. Uh, we, we have one person who continues to win sabotage. And we're not entirely sure why. <laughs> um, oh, look at that. Someone else is uh, doing stuff in Airtable yeah. with mm-hmm. uh, board games. That's fun. Um, I, I've actually, I've had a kind of a, a thought in the back of my mind for a long time to build a, uh, 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 a, a web service for this kind of thing of uh, scoring board games and tracking. There, there are some web services out there for like tracking uh, your scores in board games. But uh, one of the things that my uh, my Airtable base, in particular one for uh, a game called Seven Wonders uh, does, is that I actually provide a scoring sheet uh, in the version of a form, uh, an Airtable form that gets shared out that makes it easier to score the game because it's actually a pretty complex game to score. Uh, You have to do a lot of math. And so my scoring sheet just makes that easier. uh, And it does all the math for you uh, and then produces all the statistics and whatnot in in the Airtable backend. Um, But yeah, that's kind of one of those, uh, I don't know, dreams I've had is uh, building a web service for that. Uh, But to your question, Camille, um, most of the board games I play are are not... uh, not the type that are necessarily suited to, uh, to, to competitions like that. Um, I don't do, I don't know, uh, like Ma- magic, the gathering or Pokemon. I really, I I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not up on, on the, uh, competitive board gaming community. So not really sure what that would look like, but yeah. Okay. Just checking, just wondering. Well, you have another demo. I do, yeah. Let's take a look at that. One question right, maybe I had um, oh, sure. before you get into that. Talk a little bit about um, you You were pretty prominent in the community and, and answering a lot of questions. How did you get into that? What, what's been that experience like and in just interacting with people on the community? Sure, yeah. Um, how did I get into it? I think I had someone answer a question for me. Uh, I believe it was Alex Wolf. Actually, I can mm-hmm. I can quite uh, quite vividly remember the first time. Yeah, I I thought like oh, I want to do this. It now works at Airtable, or at least last time I heard did. I don't know if he's still there. Yeah, um, yeah. So I yeah logged into the forums there, and honestly, I think it was I think that may be the first like online forum community that I ever joined in <laughs> my life. Uh, And I posted my question and just wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, And then someone gave me an answer and Alex gave me an answer and explained how to implement it. And I was like, oh, and that was a moment both of seeing uh, the value of the community and then also like expanding my mind to, oh, if I just think a little differently about how I approach things in Airtable, you know, and don't, don't just stay within the box of, you know, this is this type of field. It's supposed to do this, but, oh, I can actually use it to do something else that, Mm -hmm. you know, that isn't necessarily implied by the name. Um, And yeah, that just opened up a whole world for me where uh, as I was building out things for uh, that construction company I was working for at the time, uh, I was just continually referencing the forums to see what creative things people were doing to get around, uh, you know, some of the shortcomings that Airtable has. Uh, and how to just do things creatively and set things up creatively and then started seeing other people asking questions uh, about um, uh, perhaps challenges that I had found a way to overcome uh, challenges that I had you know uh, found a solution to and so I started answering those questions and you know just 
it's I, I'm I'm a problem solver at heart. I'm an engineer at heart. Uh, so it, I just find it enjoyable. Uh, even in my downtime in the evening, I'll come home and browse through the forums and see if there's any fun little challenges that I can tackle. You know, it's kind of like my version of doing the crossword puzzle or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. If you want to share your screen, <clears throat> but yeah, I'm sure, sure myself and many others have benefited from your willingness to, to share with the community. So thank you for that. All sure. right. So we're going to do right. our base showcase and I will share your screen. Go for it. Cool. Um, yeah, sorry for the uh, super wide screen format there that doesn't quite fill the, the whole vertical space. But um, all right, so I have to start uh, by explaining that my wife and I, uh, we sort of homeschool our kids. I say sort of because they're enrolled in an online school um, that involves uh, part homeschool curriculum and part uh, curriculum uh part online classes where uh, they, they actually attend a, uh, a class at a specified time with a teacher and other students online. Um, but we still track all of their assignments in this homeschool base. And that's a key part of uh, our adventure game because I use the adventure game to try and motivate them to get their assignments done. Um, so we, we, we input all of their assignments uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, uh, not necessarily all the details because, uh, you know, that's that's a lot of work getting hundreds and hundreds of assignments in here. But I've created scripts uh, that can at least uh, we can just say, oh, look, we know that there are going to be 120 assignments for this class. So we'll at least just create the records. And then throughout the school year, we can go in and fill them in with details as we need to. But I at least have uh, numbers for how many assignments uh, each of my kids has throughout the school year uh, so that I can put a point value on those or a coin value uh, for our adventure game. Uh, so they actually earn their coin that kind of powers our adventure game by completing their school assignments throughout the year. So if they are staying caught up, then they will stay caught up with kind of the power level that they're supposed to be at uh, during the, the course of the game. And if they get ahead in some of their stuff, uh, since some of their, their work is uh, homeschool work, they can get ahead on it, then they can kind of get ahead in power as well in the game. Um, so I'm not gonna go too much into the homeschool stuff because that's not the point here, uh, but it is uh, one of the bases that is tied into the whole system. Um, the next base is uh, where I actually uh, build out all of the uh, items and rules for our adventure game. Um, so, um, gosh, it's hard to know even where to start with this one. Um, <laughs> the items are really, um, what, what's hard is, is trying to figure out how much to talk about the game itself versus I know that the, what I'm supposed to be talking about is the air table system behind it all. Uh, but, the items really drive kind of the, the, the character progression for my kids and the, for their characters that they are playing in our adventure game. Um, so think of uh, uh, D&D. When we, when we play our board game or our, our game sessions, um, we are, uh, I am acting as the, the game master. I'm telling the story of, of what's happening uh, to their characters and what their characters are encountering as they go along. Um, and then uh, they may run into encounters where they have to, to battle bad guys or monsters. Um, and so their equipment that they have equipped on their characters uh, is, is what drives their progression and, and their growth in power as a character and their ability to tackle more and more difficult challenges. Um, so I have been just going in, in and creating uh, all of these items so uh, I have tons of, of fields. I'm, uh, actually, the majority of the fields are in their hero bases. Uh, but on their items, uh, they have uh, uh, various uh, attributes. So how much uh, will this item add to their defense score, their wit score, 
their power score uh, or their hardiness, their, their hearts. Um, how much does it cost? Uh, and then what other kind of effects may it have? Uh, and sometimes I'll try to give it fun little flavor text too uh, that they will see uh, when it gets sent to the store. And then I check this box when this item is ready to be sent to the store. And that's just a filtered view. And then I've got a filtered view for uh, each of the classes, the character classes that they can choose for their character. Um, I also just went way overboard and also made sets. So certain items can belong to item sets. And if they collect and equip uh, multiple items in a set, then they can get extra bonuses. Uh, that was a fun challenge to figure out how do I actually detect that they are equipped, they have a set equipped um, in order to let them uh, uh, equip the effect for having the set fully equipped or whatever. Uh, in the end, I just am doing kind of manual uh, uh, manual monitoring of that. And uh, you know, at the beginning of our sessions, we check and see, are you, do you have any sets e equipped? Uh, if so, then just go ahead and equip, you know, if you've got Hunter's outfit and you've got two pieces, go ahead and equip the two piece bonus. If you've got three pieces, go ahead and equip the three piece bonus as well. Um, so that's kind of how we handle that. I've been looking for a way to automate that, but haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, I'm, I'm and then sure I, there's a way. Yeah, there, there must be. <laughs> the hard part is that those, those things exist in this base, but they get synced over to the base where they're actually equipping things on their heroes. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, I also create all the effects that can be uh, like status effects that can be applied to your character during a session. So uh, if your character can, your character can be chilled or frightened or intimidated uh, and those apply a, uh, you know, some, some kind of effect on your character. So maybe some of them are uh, good effects, they're buffs. And so they actually increase uh, one of your scores. Some of them are negative ones. And so they decrease a score. Um, and then I actually also figured out a way to uh, do percentage modifiers as well. So when you equip a particular, uh, I say equip, uh, when you apply a particular effect, uh, that means adding it to your character in a linked record field. Um, it will it will apply these to your character, right? So when you uh, when you put the distracted effect on your character in the interface, which we'll we'll get to that in a in a bit here, uh, it will take away three of defense from your defense score, and it will take away two from your wit score, uh, and then these ones will do percentage modifiers. So it, this will increase your armor by 10%. And this one will decrease your armor by 10%. Um, those were all fun challenges to figure out how to how to get these things to work. But of course, I've got um, um, I've got uh, formulas that that uh, figure out how much based on these static columns and the percentage columns, how much to actually deduct from uh, from their their statistics on their characters. Um, all right, so I also do some of my my story planning and and create my encounters uh, for them here in this space. Uh, but the rest is done uh, by syncing all of this information over to um, over to a base that I've created for each of my kids, and this is where their hero lives. So. We sync over their school data, their school year data. So their total assignments for the school year, how many they've completed to this point. And uh, this is their total coin that they can earn for the entire school year of our gaming session. Uh, so then I can just figure out how much is each, each assignment worth and how much do they have so far based on how many of their assignments they've completed. And so that kind of makes up their coin purse. Um, and then I sync over all of the effects that I create in my uh, game master base. I sync over all of the uh, uh, items into a store. Uh, so for each of their heroes, they have selected a character class. So uh, my boy Brady has selected a warrior. And so I sync over uh, the 
warrior store view to him so that he can only see items that are usable by his character class. Uh, and then this heroes table is where his hero lives. And this is the one that has uh, a whole bunch of fields uh, that are essentially allowing him to equip items by adding them into a linked record spot for a particular um, uh, item slot uh, for his character. So like the head item is, you know, is going to be filled with uh, a bunch of options for helmets that he can wear as a warrior. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, limited to only uh, one record can be equipped. So they can only equip one uh, item in each item slot. Uh, and then I've got all the roll-ups that help to uh, help me to figure out how much of their coin they have spent out of their coin that they have earned and figure out how much they have left to spend. Uh, roll-ups to figure out um, how much of each stat does each piece of equipment give them. So each, uh, each piece of equipment is going to have multiple roll-ups for figuring out for each of the four main statistics that their character has um how much do they have in total uh but of course this is unwieldy to work with right this giant horizontal table uh so kind of the key here is the automations and interfaces uh, that i've created for doing this kind of stuff i'm going to poke into the automations real quick first because these kind of power our encounters um and i will uh just kind of show that they're they're all really simple uh, click a button, update a record uh, automations. There's there's nothing too crazy going on here. Um, but these are essentially for uh, uh, managing their health and damage that they've taken and healing that they do uh, during our encounter. Uh, and then uh, also uh, when we're done with an encounter, everything gets reset. Uh, many times we'll have multiple encounters in a session um, and so we kind of reset everything for them in between encounters. Uh, so these automations are, are taking care of those things for us as we're, as we're playing the game. And then in interfaces, I have an interface with two, uh, two views. So the shop view is uh, my kids are in here during the week uh, as they're earning coin by completing their assignments. Um, and they're in here uh, shopping for items so these items are all separated by type. So if they know, oh, I want to, I want to get a new belt, they can click here and look at all the look through all the options. They're sorted by their cost, and the cost is relative to their power. Um, so, you know, the the more powerful items are further down the list, uh, but they also cost more, and they are not allowed to spend over their purse limit. So as they uh, spend money here, uh, so let's say I unequip that belt that he has currently and I equip this most expensive one instead for him we'll see his uh, his purse value go down um, actually I wonder if that one actually costs the same as the other one but you know if I unequip it you can see he gets credited back the the money there in his purse and so at the beginning of the session I just have to check and make sure that uh, uh, all of them are above zero or uh, zero, zero or more dollars. They cannot be in the negatives in the coin that they've spent. Um, and then as they equip these items, it also affects their statistics. So they can kind of see in real time uh, how, you know, a new piece of equipment is going to affect their character and, and grow their power. Um, and then I've kind of laid this out in a, a paper doll fashion. Um, if you're familiar with kind of uh, role-playing video games, a lot of times they'll have a little picture of your character and you can kind of, you know, drag items onto your character you know, into particular slots. So I've kind of tried to emulate that here to where you've got the helmet, uh, amulet, and then the shoulders, you know, everything kind of is laid out to make sense for, you know, this kind of represents your character, what your character looks like. Uh, and I try, <laughs> try to find pictures online that I can use for all these uh, equipment that actually takes the most work. Yeah. I was uh, going to ask a question. One, is this a game system that you designed completely yourself or is it some 
you know, like open source game system. And two, how many items are in here? And did you find it? What? <laughs> this is yeah. insane. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's my own game system. Uh, what? Of course, the ideas, the ideas are, are just sort of an amalgam of things that I've experienced. You know, I've played a fair bit of d d in, in my time and uh, a good number of uh, role-playing video games. And so I just kind of take the elements that I like the most uh, from various games that I've played and figured out how can I make this simple enough for my kids, but also engaging enough that, you know, it matters what equipment you're wearing and it matters what decisions you make and what skills you use in an encounter and whatnot. Um, so yeah, how, how many uh, items? Um, 380 almost so okay. far and Jesus. counting. For, <laughs> for comparison's sake, I wanted to make a, just a simple initiative tracker because I play D&D &D, um, okay. and then I gave up. Like I never completed it. And that is one tiny portion of what you've constructed here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I've got a little bit of an initiative tracker, I think, uh, in my, in my encounter part, I wasn't even going to go into that because yeah, I, I sure I'm already up. over. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm already over the time you've allotted for me to share this stuff, but um, mm -hmm. I, I'll try to go quickly and move on to, to, to the other portion of the interface here, but also they can equip skills and spells. Uh, Brady here is a, a warrior, so he doesn't have spells, but he's got a bunch of skills that he can use in an encounter, and uh, they do various things. Um, so yeah, we we then uh, go over when we're ready to play, go over into the, the play interface. Um, and this is where we manage our encounters during, uh, during our sessions. So I've, uh, th this has kind of been a work in progress where I've realized um, uh, one, one of my recent additions, for example, is I created a formula field that rolls up all of the different uh, effects that their equipment is giving them because they were having to go scroll down and be like, oh, what did this one do? Oh, okay, that one lets me do this thing. And it was just kind of a, a pain to, to go down and figure out everything that they had available to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I rolled all that up into... Uh, a, a formula field that I'm displaying here for them to make it easier. Uh, one of the things I didn't have at the beginning was this counter. Um, uh, so they were just having to literally count the hearts. Like, oh, how much health do I have left? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, and that was a pain. So I created, you know, added to that formula field to add this. How many do you have left out of your total? Um, and then uh, during the encounter, they, this is where they would uh, uh, add effects. So if their character gets stunned, uh, I tell them, all right, uh, you know, the, the boss that you're fighting just stunned you. So Brady, you need to, uh, you need to add the, the stunned encounter effect. And when he does that, he's gonna see all of his uh, defense. Is he? Is he going to see his defense score go down? Oh, <laughs> uh, we're not in an encounter. That's why. Mm, yeah. yeah, watch. <laughs> um, so he asked that at the beginning of an encounter. We click begin encounter, and now that button shows we're we're in an encounter. Now, if he equips this, see, you got stunned, and all of his defense is gone all of a sudden. Oh my um, God. We have to manually track uh, <laughs> RPG. Yes, very nice. <laughs> Um, we have to manually track, uh, the rounds, like how long, if he's, you're stunned for two rounds, uh, we, that's a thing we have to manually track. And then once what's, uh, it's expired, I tell him he can take it off and, uh, it goes back there. Um, and then taking damage, uh, this is the stuff that's, that's, uh, done by the automation. So I say, you know, the boss hits you for, uh, three damage. So you type three into there and click the damage. The automation is going to run. And it's not immediately, uh, you know, doesn't register immediately, but a couple seconds later, uh, that registers. Uh, let's say one of his uh, teammates heals him. Uh, you take two healing, so you can hit that and apply it. And uh, a couple seconds later, you've got a couple hearts back. Um, yeah, that's how we, we manage our encounters. Uh, the temp health is there because that's separate from healing because you Temp health can actually, temporary health can actually put you over mm -hmm. your health limit. Um, so let's say he gains five temporary health from a skill that he uses. 
Uh, now his maximum health is higher than it was before, but healing can never put you over your, your, your healing, uh, your health maximum. Um, so yeah, that's my, my fun little, uh, gaming system that I've built. Awesome. We play our sessions with dice, just like D and D and, uh, manage all of our statistics here in Airtable. That's so cool. This is insane. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank well you. Then. It's a lot of fun. It's been it's been really fun to build too. That's so cool. Thank you, Jeremy, for sharing that. I'll just say yeah. I'm glad my kids don't watch uh, my videos because they would be jealous. They'd say, Dad, you could be doing this at work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, um, I gave up. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Cool. Let's well, uh let's to... spin... yeah, one more. Oh, sorry. I just, I, I know that I talked nonstop through that whole thing. Wanted to just check and see if there were any other questions. We'd be here all day. Okay. I have, I have several. Yeah. You yeah. might need to connect with uh, top shelf gaming wants to figure out how to have the temp health be another heart color to differentiate. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. I, I was waiting for that, but I didn't want to bring it up. Oh, okay. There's so many <laughs> cool things you could do with that. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Well, yeah, one of, one of the challenges has been trying to keep it all within Airtable. Uh, and then, you know, also, um, I don't want to pay for all three of my kids as pro users. Right. Uh, so actually, the other thing that I do to kind of get around that is I have a free workspace for each of them mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. is shared and they, they have editor access to that free workspace. Uh, so their own hero base lives in that free workspace. But when I need to sync everything, right, like I'll spend the week working on new items and whatnot. And when I'm ready to sync it all, I'll move their hero base into my pro workspace, run all the syncs to their sync tables, because you can't, you can't do uh, synced tables in a free base, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll run all those syncs in my pro workspace, and then I'll move the entire base back into their free workspace for them to do their shopping and for us to play our game sessions. Hmm. So that's kind of how I, I get around that. Interesting. Cool. Thank you, Jeremy, for sharing that. That's awesome. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, you might get people reaching out to, to learn more. <laughs> Let's finish up real quick. A shout out to our community. We'd love to have you join. Builtonair.com slash join gets you into our community and join our Slack or subscribe to us on our YouTube channel trying to grow that as well. We're going to finish off with some scripting time with Ali. Awesome. Um, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. All right. So here I have a very basic example of a CRM. Um, the two tables that we're interested in for this example are just people and interactions, which is something very common that people are using Airtable for. Um, we've got rows of interactions that are each linked up to a person, um, some notes involved with that, a date, et cetera, all sorts of little CRM things that you could use over here. But this is a use case that people often ask about. And this is what I've settled on doing to address this for now until Airtable hopefully someday comes out with a toggle that we can just use. Um, and that is having to do with the order of these linked records in this linked record field. So one cool thing I've got going on here is this roll up field that's showing all the interaction notes and they're each time stamped. Um, but you do have to scroll down all the way to the bottom to find the most recent ones. So if I add a new one for John Doe here, let's just put in today's date. Now, when I look at this interaction notes, it's all the way down at the bottom. And it's also the last record in this linked record list here. Now you can manually drag these around if you want, but nobody really wants to do that for every interaction that's logged. Um, and it most of the time people want to see that most recent one at the top. Um, and especially when it comes to a field like this where we're rolling up based on the date it'd be great to have these in a particular order. 
So I'm hopeful that maybe one day within this field configuration, you'll be able to choose a field to sort this field by. That would be amazing. But until that happens, you can accomplish the same thing using a script. So I've written a script that will function in an extension. I also have an automation version of it and I'll touch it really quickly. But you can see when I click that button here, now this field has resorted and my most recent one is at the top. And same thing here, you can now see the most recent one is at the top. Um, it's a very simple script. I marked it up because I'm thinking I'll probably post this somewhere if anybody wants to use it. Um, but I'm basically just defining the two tables and then the linked record fields between each and also the field I want to sort by. And then I'm choosing that record on the parent table, so the people table in this case. And then I select all of the records on the child table. If you know for a fact that you're going to have less than, I believe it's 100 linked records per record, you could just put the record IDs as a parameter into this up here. Um, to limit it so you don't have to suck up everything and then filter through. But I wrote it assuming that people might have more than 100 records to sort through. So essentially, this is the part that's really important, is when you select records on a table, you can pick the fields you want to suck up. But you can also pick the sort order, so the order in which you want these records to appear. Um, and you can define a field and then also a direction. So in my case, because I want the most recent date at the top, I've picked descending. Um, if I wanted it to go the other way, I would have written ascending ASC. Um, but that picks everything up in order by date. And then I'm filtering it down to only the ones that are linked to the parent record that I chose. Um, and then just updating that linked record field with the sorted interactions. Um, the only difference I have for my automation is because I've got this button clicked at the people level. Um, I have instead I have my automation triggering off of the interactions table. Um, and I thought that that was the safest thing because especially when you're sorting by date, as soon as you put a date into that interaction, Airtable starts trying to evaluate what that date is. So if you're just saying person is not empty and date is not empty for a new interaction, go sort everything, you might not have the right date fully entered yet before this triggers. So I've flipped it so that I need to also put in a status of logged for that interaction in order for it to trigger everything off. Um, and I'd manually would do that after I know I've entered everything in for the automation. Don't have to worry about this if it's coming from a form, um, but if you are doing manual entry, then I would do it that way. Um, and then, so the only difference here is that I'm grabbing that linked record of the person the interaction is linked to instead of the actual interaction record itself, if that makes sense. I know we're over time, but very cool and very useful yep i agree that it should be a toggle yes that would be wonderful didn't the original version go the other way so if you have a legacy base isn't there a toggle of switching the order i okay i've been so confused because i i feel like that toggle appears and disappears at for, with no rhyme and reason like some of the linked record fields i see have that toggle there that say show linked records in reverse order. Some of them don't. I don't know why some do and some don't. And also it's very superficial because it's just going to, it doesn't actually work well. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Ali and Camille for joining us. And Jeremy, thank you so much for joining and sharing your, your game with us. Um, I imagine your kids are enjoying that and getting straight A's because of it. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you all for, for joining. That is the end of our show and we will see you. We'll be back next week for episode eight. Take care, everyone. Thank you.
you for joining today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to check out our sponsor, ontair.com. And we will see you next time on the Built on Air podcast.